Good morning, America. This is Michael Zakand. And I'm Simran Sandu. This is our future podcast. We are building the number one entrepreneurship podcast for young people. And the reason why is that we study the most successful young entrepreneurs and we break down their tactics, their stories, their strategies, so you can learn from them and apply them to your own business. And just like last week, we're actually going to talk about a few new ideas that you can go and run with. Yeah, I mean, they're good ideas this time. They're good ideas. We had a lot of fun just brainstorming these. Like, I actually really enjoyed the process. So I hope it's valuable for for the listeners, even if it's just a, a fun mental exercise for us. Let's dive into our first story. I want to tell you about the guys over at Line Leap. So... What if I told you a group of frat boys digitized America's bars? Wow. They brought technology to an industry that the last innovation was just accepting credit cards, right? That's crazy to think about in the in the 2010s when they started the business. But let's go back to University of Michigan. You know, we run the world. There's a lot of founders who come from that school, and there's more than I can name off the top of my head. But the Line Leap guys really exemplify it. They were sophomores on campus. By the way, I should mention the names. It's uh, Max Schauf, Patrick Skelly, and Nick Becker. Those are the guys who started Line Leap. Three Musketeers taking yeah. over this space, man. Think about it. When you're trying to build a business on a college campus, there's like a few things that students do that you can tap into, right? They eat, they go to sports games, they study. And they party. So of those four things, the Line Leap guys chose the partying side of things. So with that curiosity for trying to solve a problem on the college campus, they went over to the glorious location of Rick's American Cafe. It's one of the best bars in Ann Arbor. And I guess they just kind of wanted to have a conversation with the bar owner, right? Being like, hey, what do you guys use in terms of technology, software? You know, we're tech guys, entrepreneurs. And they just realized how... The, the bar was using no technology whatsoever, right? Like completely analog. Um, you know, cover was paid in cash. Um, you know, the bar was a nightmare with, you know, giving your credit card and signing wet checks on the counter. So they knew there was an opportunity somewhere here, right? Like I feel like the first step if you're building kind of a tech product is find the space where where tech is is not used yet, right? And before I get into the actual problem that they solved, I think that's like a good thesis for young entrepreneurs, right? Go and knock on the doors and figure out what problems these businesses have. And maybe it's not even a problem. Maybe it's just that they're not using anything. Yeah. And they were like reluctant to change, right? Like this wasn't an easy sell for these guys. No, it wasn't. And I think one of the best takeaways from the Line Leap business is yeah. sometimes the hardest customers to sell are the best customers. So I'll get to that. Um they approach these bars and these bars are owned by like individual entrepreneurs, right? So the bar industry is very fragmented. If you look at the restaurant space, you have massive chains and bars. That's just not the case. And what they found was, you know, whenever there's a long line at a bar, there's always that kid with the, you know, the Benjamin Franklin in his pocket who's trying to get to the front, you know, slip it in the bouncer's hand and get inside the bar. I don't want don't to be waiting in line, right? So they identified that behavior, that money that you're tipping to the bouncer to get in that's not getting to the bar owner. Yeah. So immediately they they saw revenue exchange that was happening outside the bar's premises that should be owned by the bar. So they came in and innovated with their company Line Leap, which enables people to skip the line at bars by buying a fast pass beforehand, and it also enables people to pay cover using the app so you don't have to, you know, go and use the ATM before you go in and give cash or there needs to be a long credit card transaction at the front door. So they sped everything up and streamlined this process and created a brand new revenue stream so these bars could tap into. I like that it was such a low risk thing for these bars, right? They have these lines outside the bar and they're just not doing anything with it. And it was like, hey, you can actually make some money doing this and we can create this streamlined process. It's all in one kind of app where they can order drinks. They can um, do all these things beforehand and they get to absorb this additional revenue. It's a good, a great idea. Yeah. I mean, the mechanism of value exchange was yeah. already in occurrence, right? So they simply just transferred it into the bar owner's pocket, which was a great sell. But at the end of the day, like it was still extremely hard to sell this product. Yeah. Uh, Nick told us a story of how, you know, when they embarked on this opportunity, they, they saw, you know, what was in the wings And they drove to like 2,000 college campuses in one summer, right? Yeah. So the three guys, you know, got in the the Camry and just drove around the country, right? Going to the best college campuses, trying to pitch bar owners. And it was a huge uphill battle, right? Because even if there's no risk, they only take a percentage of the fees generated from each user that's transacting with a service at the bar, whether it's line skip, paying for cover. Mm -hmm. But that still doesn't mean it was an easy sell because just taking a chance on some kids like... I'm a bar owner. I don't really know. I don't use it. I don't even, might not even use a smartphone. You know, 
I don't really care for this stuff. Like people already come to my bar. Like I'm the best bar on campus. Like why do I have to worry about using technology in some way, right? Um, and they had a, a very tough time, but eventually the best college bar, I think it was at Penn State, it was called Champs, took a chance on them. Yeah. And that was like their first blue chip client. Like that was the best client they could have ever had. So they get a call from him. They're like, he's like, yeah, I want to use their service. And he told me the story of how they're all in the Toyota Camry <laughs> and they crashed it on the way from Florida back up to Penn, yeah. Pennsylvania. Right. And they were like, oh man. So they went and sold it for $200 at a scrapyard. and got on a Greyhound and somehow they got the deal, right? So they have like a, a good little entrepreneurial like, That's hustle gonna story That's going to be a good story there. for the biography. Oh, it'll be a great story for the yeah. biography. Uh, it really only takes one person to take that chance on you. Of course. And once they had proved it out with that bar, they were able to you know scale around the country. Well, I like that they did things that didn't scale in the beginning. Mm -hmm. They actually drove to a thousand different bars over the span of four months. I believe they were in school at this point. So they would find like these open weekends or they would find the time after class and go drive. Yeah. The three of these guys in this Camry, right? <laughs> yeah. And like that wouldn't scale over the long term, but... I think it's just a good way to get in front of the customer and going one step further, right? Going yeah. the extra mile where it's like, hey, we've got a new idea here. I know it may sound a little different than what you've been exposed to before. I think it can really add value. And I think going in person, going the extra step can make all the difference, right? Yeah. They went the extra step and they got the sale and they yeah. got these, these original customers. And it was still a, a gargantuan sales effort, right? Of the 350 bars, I think, on their platform currently, right. 270, there's 275 owners, right? So normally a bar owner only has one or two bars, right? So it's not like you can go and, and do this hub and spoke model where you could sell to one sales exec at a chain and get then your technology put in all of them. Say you're doing Open Table, right? Or Resi, one of those platforms, and you're selling to restaurants, you get put in all of them. They have to go to each individual bar and make the pitch. However, it's made for a super sticky business mm. because these bar owners, they don't churn, right? Once they've accepted to use the platform and they're generating revenue, there isn't really, they aren't looking for other technologies. Like that's never a part of their mindset. If you look at someone who manages uh, software subscriptions at a big tech company, they're always looking for the next thing, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, with these B2B SaaS companies, uh, you come out with a product, it's competitive, you're getting market share, and suddenly a swarm of competitors come around. But LineLeap has had virtually no competition in this landscape. And I think it's because of that massive hill climb to get all these bars on the platform. But now that they've reached that, they've almost monopolized this, this segment of the market. And I think it's really interesting. Yeah, I also think it's interesting because there's a physical component to this, right? There's, they're actually dealing with people in lines, right? And what's cool about it is, yes, you can start local and you can focus on these mom and pop bars to, to start and just build a foundation for yourself. But then you want to focus on these chains, right? Because <laughs> one deal means you can get 10, 20, 30, 40 bars all at the same time. And I think that's a way that you can just grow quicker, right? Yeah. Le leaning into these kind of businesses where just one big customer, one big client can truly take you from one level to the next. And I think that's in many ways why B2B SaaS has become such an attractive yeah. industry for entrepreneurs, right? You sell to these large organizations, then you get a ton of seats, right? right. Because there's right. so right. many individuals participating in the value of that software. That's why this business is so defensible. No one else wants to go and be the kid in the Camry going across the country and selling. It was because of that that young energy, that entrepreneurial hustle, doing the sales that no one else wanted to do with the product that no one else was thinking of in that right, time, right. that they were able to build this effective moat. And there's another great lesson from this story in that the guys, they've raised $10 million to this point. It's incredibly yeah. impressive. They're very a high multi-millions valuation. I can't say it on the show, uh, but I'll blurt it out. It's Pretty wild, right? You're just gonna drop the info on them like well, that. Well, no, I'll be blurting it out. Oh, the show. oh okay. yeah, yeah. It's just for you and I to know. Isn't <laughs> that, that's pretty wild, though. That's crazy. That's pretty good, yeah. right? Um, so what they did was they raised six figures of venture funding before they left their college campus. So what Nick did was pulled up to the ZLI at Michigan like every day, right? And he was just like, "We're trying to build this business. We need support from the uni. We need support from the uni." So he had another co-founder at Wisco, and then he was doing pitch competitions. He won 15 grand there, 10 grand there, 15 grand there, right? They they really leaned into being young college entrepreneurs yeah. and were able to raise a lot of money without giving away equity. And I think that was like a really cool play because when you're on a college campus of a, like a top 30 university, like you have an incredible opportunity to get funding out of your school. 
They didn't like originally plan for this to be a multi-billion dollar company, which they want to do now. But they were just like, how can we de-risk this so this can be our full-time job after college, right? We want to work on a meaningful problem and scale a business. And I think that was a really awesome perspective. It's like, we're sophomores in college. Yeah, what a simple goal, how do we, yeah, right? How do we get to senior yeah. year and pay ourselves a salary? Exactly. I think it was they so didn't simple. even have anything ambitious in mind. It wasn't like, we're going to turn this into a billion-dollar idea. It yeah. was just, hey, can I just work on this full-time? Yeah. Will we make enough money? And I thought that yeah. was cool about them. But going back to the non-dilutive capital that you can get from universities, I think they make it pretty easy for you to be able to get this money, right? Like, I don't, I think everyone knows that these are, most of these ideas aren't going to work. Like, these are young kids. They're going to make a bunch of mistakes, but they're willing to throw in that 25 to 50K check. I remember um, on a previous venture I was trying to do, we were at Purdue University and they had this thing called um, the Foundry. And they had this black and gold competition where you could get 10K, whatever. And they were just handing that out like candy. Like, it really wasn't that hard. So I think you should totally take advantage of it if you're at a university currently. And even if it's not more, even if it's not much more than just an idea on paper. I also want to go back to something you emphasize on the show a lot, which yeah. is starting a business is not inherently risky. Because they were students in college and they de-risked it by right. doing as much as they could like yeah. by this end date, right? And maybe they missed out on recruiting for big corporate jobs and stuff, but you can always get that bag back, right? If you have a good degree from a good 100%, school. 100%, yeah. You can always go that route, right? So they were like, let's just commit our time on campus to making a business work. If it doesn't work, like we could obviously just go off into the world with our skills and, you know, we have this great degree from these universities and we'll get a job. But I think that's a great thing. Uh, I think that's a great perspective for college entrepreneurs to have in that I have a finite amount of time on this campus. I want to get to X point. Like I want to be able to pay myself a salary with my business by the time I graduate. And if you look at it through that thesis, like you're setting yourself up for success. It takes years to build a successful business. I remember, you know, the the timing with our future, like I was a senior, I was like fall of senior year when our company uh, began to generate revenue. And I was like, okay, well, I should be at a level where I can pay myself a salary come May, right? And that's what I was building towards. And then it became so much bigger, right? But it's like these small goals, like these landing points, these de-risking points, right? Where you get to this step of the ladder and then you get to this jumping point and then, you know, it's sequential. Yeah, it sequential. feels daunting too, yeah, right? Yeah. Like if you can just break it down into smaller milestones that you just yeah. need to hit, right? Like you don't need to worry about you know, three, four steps ahead just yet, yeah. especially if you're still trying to build a foundation, right? You're just yeah. trying to even see if the business works. But I like that they built a business for themselves, right? Like they were college students. They're going to these bars. And they're frat boys. They're frat, it's, they're it's, frat guys, like, right? We don't want to wait in line. Exactly. Let's build a business. Like my buddy wanted to go to the bar, but he didn't want to wait in line. So he built a line skip business. Well, like- Build any, for the outcome you want. They built a business that they want, but I like the fact that they- leaned into the social component because yeah. I think anything that pertains to parties, events, right? There's a feeling of exclusivity that comes into it. So if you can lean into that, right? You see all these people standing in line and you've got this golden card or whatever yeah. that just lets you in before everyone, especially when it's a big night. Think homecoming at Michigan where right. everybody's in town. Yeah. You're trying to go to the same bars, right? There's probably two or three bars that everyone wants yeah. to go to. And now, boom, they let you in because you have access to Line Leap and you can pay for in advance. Why would you not do it? It's a great feeling, man. Yeah. Like I bought this line skip pass when I was on Michigan's campus and I loved yeah. just like getting right to the front because like those lines were long, usually like an hour or so, like trying to get into Rick's and Skeeps is also super long, right? So they solved a the problem and there were people willing to pay for this line skip pass. But I think what these guys have done is created a great entry point into a much wider space. So a lot of the businesses we've, we've spoken about so far on the pod, like they're doing one thing, they're like in their earliest stages, like they found a niche and they're executing on it. These guys have been building this business for five, six years now, right? They graduated like two or three years ago. So they've got the business up to, I think, eight figures in revenue. And now they can go and take the, this entry point of technology into the bars to truly revolutionize the industry as a whole. So what's the next thing they're going after beyond the original transactions of line skipping and paying cover? They're getting into the market of buying drinks inside the bar right? Which far exceeds the value of a line skip or paying cover, right? The alcohol is what generates the bulk of revenue for these bars. That's the service that they sell. And we can all agree that the user experience of ordering drinks at a bar sucks, right? Like you go up to the counter, the bartender's always asking open or closed, right? And you have to sign they can this forget wet check. Too, right? Yeah, yeah, it's just chaotic as hell, right? Yeah. So they created a uh, drink ordering system. So you can now buy drinks uh, using Line Leap's app. You connect your credit card. You already paid for the line skip or the cover. And now they have extended into 
this higher leverage opportunity inside the bar. So you essentially order your drink and then you could just show the screenshot or QR code to the bartender and boom, like you get your drink. It's a, such it's such a more frictionless experience for for being able to order a drink. And we all know how hard it is to get served in a, in a busy bar. Yeah, I like that with the product line extension, you can actually grow up with customers as well. They're in a really unique spot where they're getting people really young. They're in college, right? So as a college student, where are you spending a lot of your time? It's in bars. As a young professional, after you graduate, you're probably going to concerts, sporting events. So there's opportunity to go do right. the same model there. Right. You get married. You have kids. Now where are you spending your time? Amusement parks. Right now you can replicate this model there. They all face very similar challenges. Yeah. And because they already have such a head start with like the bar market, it's probably not going to be it's still going to be a hard thing to do, but they're best positioned to pull it off versus anybody else. Yeah, I love that you say that. They are not a bar technology company. They're a capacity company, yeah. right? Whenever there's a lot of people trying to get into a physical space, Line Leap can be the company like that comes in, right? Look, I think however long these guys want to keep yeah. building this business, they've been in the trenches for a long time. Right. I think they're set up for a win, right? Like whether it's in the the mid eight figures right now or in the future in the you know nine figures, um, but they're going to win. I think they've built a really sticky business and a hard business to get into. So we came up with a few business ideas for you guys, like based on like what we think Line Leap did well. So for one, they were saving people time. Time is money. That's our first principle here for thinking of business ideas based on Line Leap. Next is exclusivity or access, right? That's what they're giving people, a front of the line skip. And then the third is like targeting rich college kids as a demographic, right? You can't lose when you're targeting uh, these rich college kids. So let's get into the first idea, which is uh, Expedia for fraternities. So, you know, when I think of a business that might be able to work in the Greek life world, yeah. you know, I think back to when we had formals and we were doing planning for that kind of thing. Like sometimes our e-board would completely fuck, fuck up the, the bag. Like there was one time we had a day party and we were super pumped and they like, they told the buses to come on Thursday instead of Friday. So there's just a lot of incompetencies when you're looking at your frats executive board, right? Like, what do you expect, right? So if there was a platform where you can book these formals and events for fraternities and then have a list of like approved vendors that are willing to like take on fraternities and the pricing is transparent, like you could end up having a pretty good business because every frat and sorority has a formal like every semester. And because of that, like they're spending like tens of thousands of dollars, right? Between alcohol, like the venue, the buses, right? So it's actually a pretty big, like- That's yeah, a pretty nice chunk of change. It's a good chunk of change, right? Yeah. And there's, you know, thousands of fraternities and sororities like across the country in these college campuses. So I think it could, could work, especially with the, like these young kids not really know how to plan shit. Yeah, with an approved vendor list, I could definitely yeah. see how that would be helpful. Because I think a lot of nice hotels, they also don't want to host yeah. formal parties and, and fraternities, right? And I don't yeah. blame them for good reason. Yeah. Like, yeah. these kids don't give a shit. They're just going to tear it up. Anyways. Yeah, and throw up on the bus. Yeah. And the transportation company isn't stoked. But if you could just find the companies that are willing to take these these gremlins and grem women and just like, you know, bring yeah. them in, have show them a good time. All right, like, boys, we're hitting the holiday. <laughs> <laughs> there's some there's some good money to be made for sure. So uh, you had another business idea. Yeah, another idea I was thinking about was along the lines of credit because a lot of young people either don't have a credit history or they have a bad credit history because you're young, You this is like your first credit card. You Maybe you forget a, uh, a few, maybe you forget to pay a few bills. Maybe you're right. getting a little swipe happy over there and you're just buying shit you shouldn't be. Um, so I thought about a credit card with this low preset limit, right, that had a really unique or um, really seamless analytics process where you could track your spending. Yep. It's very user friendly. And I actually think this can build really good habits because if you can start early and kind of build that financial literacy. Yeah. I mean, you could also like really make the branding around college students. And exactly. It's like, what do you have in your card? Right. Yeah. I was also thinking what you could do is like make it really seamless for international banks to transact with this credit card. So a lot of these rich kids coming from China, India, overseas, right. Having their parents' banks being able to send money very quickly quickly within this app, I think would be a really good value add. Totally. And like giving away like DoorDash subscriptions. The and branding like would be so key, yeah. right? Like if the entire reward system is built around things that a college student would need, I think like Netflix yeah. memberships, um, credits to DoorDash, 
uh, credits to maybe the local bars in town or Lime like, Leaf. Yeah, Lime Leaf. Lines get passed for exactly. free. Exactly. Yeah. We should do this business and then partner with those guys. All right, guys, we're taking this business. I for actually ourselves. think this is a. I, <laughs> <laughs> Forget I, the new ideas. <laughs> I actually, we're leaving Morning Brew. Yeah. No, I actually think this is a, a really, really strong idea because what we were thinking about is when you build a business for a college campus, the challenge is like, having people grow up past it. I think Morning Brew did a great job in that people off, like most of the people who read Morning Brew, like a lot of them probably subscribed when they were like a student at a college, like in 2015 to 2020. And now they've grown up with the brand as they become young professionals. It's like when we talked about uh, Zogo on the second episode of the pod, it was like Bolin was getting all this financial data on young customers and then he was able to sell that to banks because they were interested in getting home loans and car loans. Totally, yeah. Like you could totally like either create an affiliate business out of this, like with partner with Amex and these other firms to like graduate people into new cards, whether it's through content and education, or you could just offer your own subset of cards and you could adjust the branding. So it really grows up with people. It's like, I'm already using this card. Let me just add another three credit cards to this as I grow up and I need a car loan and a home loan. So it could be a really good like entry point out of college as well. And I think that's the most important thing to consider whenever you're targeting young people. Totally. I think it's a great idea. I want to talk about my friend Princego. She's 25 years old, and I think if there's anyone that can go build a billion dollar company, it's him. Um, has a path that I think a lot of people would resonate with. He was just someone who really enjoyed building things, but wasn't sure that entrepreneurship was the path for him. His dad was an exec at a big company, but he never felt like he had meaningful equity. And so what he drilled into Prince's head was you need to build equity in order to have true wealth in the long term. And so Prince thought about that a lot, and he decided to go study aerospace and mechanical engineering and ends up at NASA. Um, first off, like, props to him. What a hard internship to, to get. Yeah, I um, could never get into NASA. Yeah. He's doing a lot of monotonous tasks. They're having him do quality control, compliance work, and he thinks to himself, why don't I just go build a software to go automate all of this stuff? Like, do I really need to be the one ticking off all these boxes? Ends up building the software, super effective, goes to his boss, and he's like, hey, I just built this incredible software. I think it's going to be really effective. You guys should go build a team around this internally and go do this. His boss is like, yeah, cool idea, but you know, just like any other big company, they don't really do anything with it, right? right. So it doesn't really get any traction. But what does any budding entrepreneur with a good idea do? They go to Y Combinator. Yes, sir. Yes, exactly, right? So goes to Y Combinator and realizes there's an opportunity to go apply this quality control software to e-commerce. Now, why is that? What he realized is that a lot of consumer brands are based here in America, but their manufacturers are overseas. And there's actual regulation that whenever you import a good from overseas, it has to meet some kind of compliance quality control software. And he goes deeper down this rabbit hole and realizes this third party inspection market yep. is huge. Some of these companies are doing over $500 million a year in top line, but there's a lot of friction because what he realizes is these American brands don't want to work with these people overseas, right? Like there's language barriers, there's vetting that needs to take place. A lot of them have different bandwidth issues. So he creates this company called Factored Quality, and it's essentially this marketplace where he's connecting consumer brands with quality control teams overseas. They do the vetting, they provide this analytics software that you actually get real-time data across all parts yep. of your supply chain. Yeah. So your product, your suppliers, um, and other aspects of the quality control process. Yeah. So when I order a product overseas, I can now see a full inspection of that individual product on the software, right? So I don't have to be there in person. Exactly. There's all these stories of entrepreneurs yeah. going out to China to see how their products are made. Like He makes that completely virtual, right? So you don't have to go to China in, in a pandemic. That wasn't a good idea. And even now, it's a little sus. Um, I won't put that on TikTok. But, <laughs> but yeah, like it, it was a very murky industry and there was a lack of transparency. A lot of these quality control companies couldn't be trusted. These inspection agencies, they were accepting bribes. They were, uh, you know, turning a blind eye when they saw a kid working behind the counter creating the sweatshirt that is going viral on TikTok. And do they also understand the intricacies of your product, right? Like, yeah. are they just like, oh, exactly. looks good enough, check off. Exactly. Because yeah. there's not only an external need through regulation, there's an internal need. Right? What he was talking about is the incentives are aligned. The company wants a great product and doesn't want any liability when it comes to the factory, but the government 
government is also wants to make sure that products coming into the United States are, are valid and have that high fidelity. So he really tapped into a market where, and he could tap into that regulation side of things. Exactly. But at the end of the day, it was still being driven by these companies wanting to build products from the United States, living in a country where products aren't made. And I think to your point, if there's regulation involved and brands and companies have to spend money, then it's great because it doesn't matter if it's a down market, it's an up market, they have to spend this money. They have to do these things to continue operating their business. So there's always some angle that you could probably go take advantage of. Yeah. I mean, the way that things were working before, like Prince's brand, right, was like, it was like trying to email back and forth with people who didn't really speak English and like, just like terrible, like kind of maybe like iPhone photos of, of products. Right. So he's really like brought a ton of transparency to the space. And it's like such a genius idea. I think it's so smart to own the origin point of any industry. So he is literally, his company is ground zero for getting a product from your idea made. And like that happens overseas. We talked about with Zach's product foreplay because he he's at the origination point for marketers creating advertisements. He can now expand into step two, step three, step four, right? He did collaboration. He did sharing. He did uh, extra features, right? Prince can now do that too, right? He's built this core infrastructure for how products are made and how companies can kind of inspect those products. And now he can get into other elements, right? He could do an affiliate package with Flexport to get those products shipped to the United States. He could do an, an insurance business, right? So he's he's ground zero for, an, for a product that can totally expand and really start to control this value chain, right? So a big takeaway, start at the origin point of the value chain if you want to build like sequentially. Yeah, I think there's a lot of room for him to move kind of to the points you're making, but it goes back to the benefits of a broker model, right? He doesn't own these facilities overseas. He doesn't have a lot of CapEx. He doesn't have a lot of overhead costs. He's just connecting. He's a liaison of sorts, right? Intermediaries are the ones who win in business. And it's all backed by this software and this analytics tool that now both sides of the equation depend on to continue building and scaling. Well, you know, about the intermediary thing, right? Like I think doing the dirty work is always an advantage young entrepreneurs will have, right? You know, no, none of those other yeah, companies who might have been thinking about Line Leap were willing to get in the Camry and drive across the country, right? Prince is willing to fly to China and fly to these countries and get these factories off the ground and get a team in Hong Kong. It's like, as a young entrepreneur with all that energy, you're, you, can, you can be willing to be an intermediary because you're dealing with all that shit, right? Of like, that dirty work, dealing with companies that aren't, you know, so great, and then reporting that information back to companies in the U.S. Like, as a young entrepreneur, I think being an intermediary is like a great business line to be in. It's a great idea to exist within because you're willing to just do a little bit more, right? And most people, if they're just want to do like a, a more automated business, like don't want to have to deal with that like groundwork. It's not a sexy business no, by any it's means, not. right? Like no. a lot of young people probably aren't thinking quality control and jumping at the bit. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I also think there's an underappreciated fact, which is a lot of businesses are won and lost at their supply chain. One example that Prince gave us is that Sheen is actually a supply chain and logistics company that happens to sell clothes. And I think it's like kind of going back to the the McDonald's example that everyone thinks, right? Like yep. it's a real estate company that happens to sell or, food. Or Starbucks is a finance company that makes coffee. Yeah, it's almost like flipping the model on its head, right? Like yeah. if you can think about it through that lens, there's so much value to be taken advantage of. Yeah, talk a little bit about uh, his value prop and like the pricing model with this company. How does it work? So if I'm like an entrepreneur in, uh, you know, Missouri who wants to build a new mug for coffee, like how do I go about using Prince's platform and how do I pay for it? Yeah. So he operates with a typical SaaS model and then he's added his own little unique flair to it. So you're paying a monthly subscription fee of some kind. And I don't believe it's anything crazy. It's very affordable for these brands, but then you pay per inspection. He doesn't necessarily just try to bundle it and force it down your throat. And now a brand has to make some huge expenditure to go through with factored quality. It's more of a fractional thing. So they're paying per visit. And I think that's why there's a lot of adoption for this. Right. I believe he has over a hundred brands that work with him currently. Right. Like the way it used to be done was probably like a, some guy running a kind of a export import export business and he yeah. was like five grand. Right. Exactly. I think transparency is the big key value driver for, for what Prince has done. Yeah, and I I don't think you need to hammer them on price in the beginning, right? Like we talked about this in the past few episodes. If they like you and they trust your product and service, they're only going to scale up, right? If they enjoyed one inspection with you, why would they not do 10 or 20 over the coming years? So it's, again, having that long-term mindset. Okay, so how did this young entrepreneur who was not in this business end up getting clients? So he has an interesting growth hack of how he built this company. So what he did was he looked at all of his LinkedIn connections and then all the brands he wanted to work in direct-to-consumer and created like a map of like 
like who was first degree, who was second degree. And he closed his first like five from client five to client 50 using that strategy. So I think it's actually something available to everyone who has like a LinkedIn profile and has spent a little bit of time on there uh, to try and engineer a map out of connections and figure out who knows who. And, and I it think doesn't really matter what industry you're It doesn't in. matter, right? Yeah. Like that's something that you can do. And he closed a ton of clients using that. So I think it's a good strategy. What, for you're telling me LinkedIn is doing what it was supposed to do? Yeah, like, but <laughs> it, it, you have to take it like a step further, right? Like Absolutely. you have to engineer your own social graph. Another thing is he took that shortcut, right? And that yeah. um, he partnered with a agency that was kind of doing all of this stuff for DTC companies, but it wasn't doing like a scalable software model. And he like aligned himself with them and worked with them on a joint venture. So in that he could get access to the market, understand, you know, the industry because Bro, he came from NASA, bro. Yeah. Like, what is the what is the tie-in between what NASA would want and like logistics technology for direct to consumer brands? So he he took a shortcut in understanding the space by like doing a joint venture with this particular agency. Yeah, I think aligning with the strategic early on, especially if you don't have much experience in that space, is yeah. so important. He didn't have the infrastructure overseas to go do this, right? He had the software tool, but the company that he aligned with, Doris Dev, did. Yeah. And so that's where he was able to pair it. And what is interesting about them is they were a customer of his first, and then they became an investor. And I feel like you see that a lot. I think there was um, something recently where Shopify had this logistics business or delivery business of some kind, and then they sold it to Flexport, right? right. And they were also an investor in Flexport originally. I may be getting that wrong, but I'm pretty sure, like, they kind of aligned the best parts of each of the big businesses and now they were able to create something really cool out of it. Yeah, I think it's interesting when you see companies that are succeeding in, in a certain industry, like there might be opportunity elsewhere in the value chain. Like Shopify was super buzzy when Prince started building as was Flexport, which had came yeah. out of nowhere to dominate the shipping market. But then Prince saw the opportunity at the the origin point of actually creating the product. Like, it wasn't hard to work with Flexport or Shopify. It was hard to work with the quality control inspectors and get a quality product off the ground. So he looked at where the moves were being made in the industry and found the space in which he could compete. So that's another great lesson for entrepreneurs. If you see a company that's making a lot of headlines, go look at other steps of the value chain to see how you could, um, if, if they're blowing up, there's probably like a lot of demand for a service that is on a different point of the chain. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, Like totally. reverse engineering your business idea by looking at who's already winning. Here's also what I find interesting. It's almost like a fun fact of sorts, but companies now use Prince's platform, Factored Quality, for due diligence. And I thought this was a really interesting thing because he's kind of at this first touch where he has all this real-time data. He's a part of the quality control process. Again, they need to be they need to make sure that they're adhering to regulations. And so when there's a lot of MA activity in this space, they're depending on Prince's platform to actually do that. So yeah. it's one of those things where he probably didn't predict that as a use case, but yeah. it kept it open enough to where it was able to be used in that way. He found a great entry point. Now he can expand just like LineLeap did. So let's cap this off with a few of the business ideas we thought were kind of relevant to, to what Prince was doing. When I think of Prince's idea, the value was in vetting, right? Yeah. You have these people in other countries. How can you vet their quality? So one of our biggest challenges in building our future was finding qualified video editors overseas. Like you have to go on Upwork and cycle through 10, 15 people until you found someone like with the right artistic abilities or skills to be able to pull off what you wanted. So I was thinking of like maybe a certification business for independent contractors where there's these online tests that certify if they have the skills that you need. So for like video editing, it's like less of like actually the skill of using Premiere and more like understanding pop culture and the English language and subtitles. So if you could have them do tests of spelling and like, is this Ryan Gosling or Christian Bale? Like being able to differentiate between the two, it's like this person has kind of the wherewithal to do this. And I think this could work for coding, all sorts of platforms, because if you give them this test, you can see how proficient they are by seeing how well they can work in a certain period of time without going and looking on Google or whatever. You can actually verify how good this person is and we know what they can do for your company. It's a great idea, especially if you're early too, right? Like you've never used independent yeah. contractors and you don't really know what to test for. So if there was some trusted stamp of approval. Stamp of approval. Yeah. It's like, hey, I needed a person for this. Like go look for this stamp. Go look for the, the, the IQ test, the, the IC test, right? If they have the check mark, they might be valid. Um, there's also another idea that you had. Yeah, so I had another idea around the vetting and testing aspect of things. You know how Tesla does a lot of these like, 
massive crashes. They're just like yeah. speeding at like some barrier and the all cars, the cars like, have exploding. To, yeah. All the yeah. car companies. Yeah, they're required to do that. Yeah. What if it's in a low stakes kind of way, right? Yeah. So maybe not cars and automotives where there's safety involved, but like a lot of these D2C brands and e-commerce, right? Like they're like chucking their products against the wall or yeah. something. And like there's people coming in where they're intentively trying to destroy the product. Yeah, yeah. Um, not only is it a great way to like show kind of um, how durable your product is, but I also thought it could be used as like great marketing. Uh, yeah, exactly. Like if we did this agency, we'll call it the fuck it up inspectors. Yeah. Right? We'll do it and we'll like to be like dude perfect as fuck, right? We'll throw shit off the roof and like we'll film it and we'll show how it doesn't break with like high def cameras. We'll license that footage out to the companies and they can use that on their website for showing how good their products are and what they can withstand. It's straight up viral organic yeah. videos, right? Yeah. It could be marketing and it could be product quality. It's like a, a duo that I think would work well. Yeah. Well, that wraps a pretty good episode, everybody. Thank you for listening. Make sure to subscribe on YouTube. Hit the like. Uh, reviews on Apple Podcasts, Spotify. Very appreciated. We're building this into a huge show. I have no doubt this is going to be massive. Definitely a multi-year play for us. And yeah. something exciting. The boys are headed to New York City in a few weeks. So if you want to be one of our first in-person interviews, give us a ring. Sh- reach out over email. We'd love to have you. The interviews are coming. We'll roll out the red carpet for you at Morning Brew headquarters if you have a dope business. So. Uh, Thank you, everybody. Stay frosty. Stay frosty. Cheers.